on our face We're looking to the sky Descending like a cloud You're standing with us now Lord, unveil our eyes You're the reason we're here You're the reason we're seeing Floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. The floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Please have a seat, and Joshua is up with some announcements. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, uh, well, thank you, Lord, for another Sunday. Um, as usual, 10 a.m., you can come here early, and we usually have the coffee and food ready, and we can hang out and talk and be a family. And uh, 10.30, worship. 6 to 8 tonight is youth group. And then tomorrow, 6 p.m., men's small group, we're going through the book of Acts. And that's going to be awesome. Um, and then we are doing the 10 to 12 ladies Bible study. That's Wednesday here at EBC. And then 3 to 4.15 is the Good News Club here at EBC. And then 6 to 7 on, on Wednesday is also our prayer meeting. Um, and then another special announcement this Saturday, uh, from 8 to 11 at the Firehouse, there's going to be a pancake breakfast for anybody who wants to go to that. Um, Raheem has made us aware that, the, that they're going to have the pancake breakfast there. 8 to 11 this Saturday. Um, and then Corey's going to pray for us. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Let's pray. Father, we just are thankful for your love. Father, we thank you for your word that we can gather today and just uh, learn more about you through it. Father, uh, we thank you that it's living and that it can change us. And Lord, I would just like to lift up Katie and her situation today. Father, that you would just uh, do a work in that, that you would be glorified, and that, Father, that your will would be done in it also. Lord, I'd also lift up um, all of our uh, church body members that have lost uh, family members in the recent days and months, Lord, that you would just draw them close as they're still dealing with uh, the grief of losing and, and trying to um, move on, Father, without those people. And Lord, we just love them. Um, just show us what we can do to help. And Lord, we just lift them up to you. Thank you for Pastor Kelly, Lord, as he brings the word today. We pray that uh, we all leave here knowing more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right, um, please stand with us again as we continue with some more singing. Oh, I love to hear the song of creation, the wind and the rhythm of the rain. The thunder speaks of your power, but there's something in the sound of the saints. I've been washed in the roar of the ocean, now peace in the echoes of the cave. And the trees of the field, they clap their hands, but there's something in the sound of the saints. From the lips of those you save. A redemption song will rise With the sound so full that it packs the skies Oh, we sing hallelujah Oh, we sing amen Hear the sound of the saints as we march on to Zion singing Hallelujah, amen Hallelujah I will hear the chorus of the angels Forever a symphony of praise I long to hear the voice of my Savior He gives us the sound of the saints But the lips of those you save A redemption song will arise Every tongue, every tribe Hear the church join bright Oh, we sing hallelujah Oh, we sing amen Hear the sound of the saints As we march on to Zion singing Hallelujah, amen Hallelujah, amen Oh, As we march on to Zion singing Hallelujah, Amen Hallelujah, Amen Oh, we sing Hallelujah Oh, we sing Amen Hear the sound of the saints As we march on to Zion singing Hallelujah, Amen Singing Hallelujah Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, Sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul It is well with my soul My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. It is well. It is well, 
the faith shall be sight, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul, it is well. echoing there.
child of God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God.
morning. Good morning, everyone. And welcome. And special welcome to our guests, those that are visiting with us, new among us, um, or back now once again. It is so good to see this. So it's been a constant trickle of, of folks coming in return. Um, Children's Church is dismissed from like fifth grade and down, if that's the will and desire of the parents. That time is afforded for them now uh, over in the other building with my wife and usually Doreen and some other helpers. Looks like Sarah's going over. Praise the Lord. Um, All right. My sin, not in part, but in whole, has been nailed to the cross. That's such a great line. Um, We're going to do things a bit similar to as we uh, did last week. Just... um, trying to approach this story of, of Joseph um, just a little bit different manner. Um, and uh, the second half's been a little bit more tricky because it's longer and we've had to sh- really kind of chop it up a bit, but I really, really hope it maintains its flow and we have all the important parts in place. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah. So we just invite each and every one. We're going to celebrate communion at the conclusion of the service today. Um, and this will actually be the first time we've, we've, uh, we're going back to um, pass the communion. Uh, first time since March of 2020. Um, so praise the Lord. Um, yeah. All right, and and still wanting to announce and really address the things that we are also, you know, wanting to start or restart. First of all, the small groups. I believe we have enough signed up. I'm going to take the sign-up sheet with me today. I believe we have enough signed up to start two groups, Um, but please do sign up before I have a chance to take it. I won't take it, be taking it later. I'll be here uh, for quite a while today. So I encourage you to sign up today, but I'm going to begin to try and make something happen out of what we've got. It really is designed to be something that we might eventually, you know, the vast majority of us are taking part in, in one of these groups, okay? Um, also, and actually more timely because we're wanting to get Sunday School for all ages up and running by the end of this month. And so far, we really still are lacking in having uh, teachers available uh, for the K to 5 and then the preschool, two classes. Um, And the more people, you know, the lighter the load that you can share and so forth. Um, I know that, uh, you know, prior to COVID, man, we had little or no trouble recruiting for almost every you know, ministry or need or activity that we had. And it seems like with COVID, it was like, well, everybody kind of stopped doing most everything. And now way too many of us are comfortable with that. And so instead of, you know, I kind of thought, well, maybe it's been a time of rest. And so it'll be really easy to get people back. But to break old patterns in two years is plenty long enough to establish them is not easy, but I encourage you to see it that way, not as a new normal to just kind of be less involved, um, but that you've had opportunity to rest from these things, and now we can go and go really uh, passionately into. We've got a lot of things coming up. We're going to be restarting our summer outreaches in the first week in June. Um, We've got um, uh, Passover, the sign-up sheet for the Passover is out in the back for the first time today. And we can only accommodate up to 36 people, you know, plus my four, because we can, 40 is the max. And, and I will boast in this, just to say that I believe that this guy right here who will lead it, um, I have been exposed to and have benefited from some of the best teachings 
and presentations of Messianic Passovers, and I believe it really is God-honoring, and, 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 and if you've never attended a Passover before, it really will blow your mind. I mean, the, the, all the ways in which Almighty God was showing his people and preparing them to be able to see when it happened and go, oh, that's what he said. It's just what he said. And it's all about, you know, Jesus. So, I um, mean, it's from, it's that from which we get communion. It's, this is, this is like, you probably, two, it's about a three-hour thing. So bear that in mind. Start, it'll start at six on Good Friday, Passover, and go till probably about nine. <clears throat> Perhaps a little less, but usually it turns out about three hours. It's a big deal. And, and God's people un, under the Mosaic Covenant were, you know, commanded to, to practice this and do this every year at Passover with close family and friends. But this is like about two hours into it, this happens with the third cup and the afikoman as the bread. So sign up for that. And... Uh, I think that's it for now. So what we've got, go ahead and come on up, Joshua. And uh, last week we looked at Joseph in the first half of where he comes in, um, in like from Genesis 37 to the end. Um, we looked at the last half, or the first half last week, and it was all about the rejected brother. It was pretty miserable. And, uh, and then this week, it's really about Joseph the, uh, the Savior, the physical Savior of Israel. Um, so just quickly some uh, real brief run up to where we were and to highlight some of the things from last time. So let's pray. Um, I just really ask God's favor on the reading of his word and on the... the, the you know, anointment of our ears to hear and understand and receive the things God would, would encourage us with today. Father in heaven, Lord God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the privilege um, to teach your word. I thank you for the privilege to gather uh, among family and friends in the body of Christ. Um, we thank you, Lord, for that. Um, help us to uh, to read well, to explain well, to hear well, and to understand well, um, to be edified, built up, encouraged, because you are here, and you are not silent, you have spoken, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last time, I mentioned this was probably 1600s BC, under, you know, one of the pharaohs, he's unnamed. Uh, most think it's probably Amenemhat or uh, Sesostris. Uh, maybe, it's fun historical research if you're into that kind of thing. Um, but the text starts with Joseph when 17 years of age. And I'll say it again. Several of you in this room are thereabouts. You're 17. Maybe you're a little less than 17. Um, you, if, if you're not 17, you likely will be soon. Um, and, and just to realize uh, the, the, the faith, the courage, the integrity, and the patience of this young man. His brothers, which there were 11 of them, plotted to put him to death. Okay? And remember, you know, Jesus, they plotted, right, to put him to death. But uh, his, bro his own brothers, rather they sold him to the Ishmaelites, um, for 20 pieces of silver, they sold him. Uh, they sold him into slavery. And then later we see that the Midianites then sell him to, in Egypt. So God finds a way to get him to Egypt. He sells him to, to Potiphar, Potiphar's household. He was, a, he was a captain of the bodyguard for Pharaoh. And... Uh, and then as you, we read the story, Potiphar's wife, you know, thought that Joseph was really hot, okay? Um, to put it in modern terms, I think what the scripture says, he was fine in form and appearance. She, man, she lusted after him. Um, he, he, you know, he was a slave, a servant, he was the pool boy um, at her house. Whether now, he could, be, he could be well over 17 by now, and probably is, 
because 13 years pass before he gets to Pharaoh. But um, she says day after day, she would say, lie with me. And day after day, he says, I cannot do this great evil and sin against God. And then it got him in trouble. She finally just got mad at him, turned it around and said, he tried to rape me. And so, so Potiphar puts him in prison. And now he's in prison for really being a righteous guy. Okay? And that's helpful sometimes, because sometimes bad things happen to good people. And that's really what this story is all about. And sometimes we never have the answer, and this one we do. But bad things happen to good people. And he was put into prison. He was falsely accused and brought before the authorities, just like Jesus was, falsely accused, went through a trial, was convicted, and was going to be put to death. Um, okay, what's next? Uh, it's the, is that, you know, the, he, he interpreted a dream of, of a cupbearer and the baker, and the cupbearer cupbearer went well, the baker didn't, and he, he said to the cupbearer ba- cup that when you get before Pharaoh, put in a good word for me, re- remind him, you know, and, and maybe he can help me out because I'm here falsely, and he didn't. He totally and utterly forgot him, the text says, and two years later, he only remembers it because now Pharaoh has a dream, and nobody, none of his wisest people can interpret his dream, Pharaoh's dream. And so then the cupbaker remembers, cupbaker, the cupbearer remembers um, that, whoa, there was this Hebrew, young Hebrew in prison that interpreted our dreams and they happened exactly as he said. So they drag him out of prison and they clean him up and they bring him before Pharaoh and he interprets Pharaoh's dream perfectly and, and, and favorably. It's a good thing. It's going to be great for seven years. The land is going to be abundant. There's going to be a terrible famine for seven years. And so now you can prepare in these seven years of abundance for those seven years of want. And, uh, and so he sets out a plan and it's perfect. And, uh, and then, just like it happened in Pharaoh's house, just like, it, oh, I didn't mention this at prison. When he was in prison, the prisoner put him in charge. I think probably even gave him the keys, if there were keys. Because he said, he put him in charge and didn't even oversee him. Joseph, you're a prisoner, but you're in charge of prison. The the, the prison guard himself could just kind of like, you know, he could sit there and scroll through Facebook at his desk all day while Joseph does all the work. He just let him do the job. And uh, it's the same thing that Pharaoh or, or that Potiphar said. He said, I concern myself with nothing in my house except what I eat. So, so he, he kept, you know, what he ate was important to him. But everything else is Joseph. It's Joseph's house. Whatever he says goes. The man was amazing and elevated everywhere he went. So now he's before Pharaoh and Pharaoh recognizes. He interprets the dream. And, then, and, and, and Joseph offers some wisdom as to how to manage these 14 years. And Pharaoh elevates him to like prime minister. Second in command but virtually in command of all of Egypt and one of the most powerful nations on earth at the time. Um, Then we get to verse 40 of chapter 40, which verse 46, he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. So 13 years have gone by. 13 years of either slavery uh, or prison. We don't know how that's divided up, when all that happened, but 13 years as a slave, servant, or in prison. And then he comes before Pharaoh. And where we're going to start today in chapter 42, 9, 1, excuse me, 42, 1, is when Moses writes, Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. That's where we ended last time, right? And said that at that point, we're at the hinge point. All this drama took place to get all these pieces in place. And then it turns to Joseph's family in Canaan, and they hear, ah, there's, there's grain in Egypt. And that's where we are, and it begins to unfold God's, the remainder of God's plan. So Joshua would resume reading there, chapter 42, 
verse 1. Now Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, Why are you staring at one another? He said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down there and buy some for us from that place, so that we may live and not die. Yeah, each of the yellows, sorry. Um, just to point out there, because I think a lot of times, you know, to kind of see it as it might happen today, you know, notice what's going on. Everybody's getting really hungry, there's no food. And the brothers, you know, these 12 brothers are sitting around, and they're just staring at each other because there's nothing to harvest. There's nothing, nowhere to go to buy. And they're just sitting around staring at each other. And so dad says, kind of like, what are you guys just doing just sitting there? You know, go do something. So here it is, you know, go down to us, for us to that place. Then ten brothers of Joseph went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, I'm afraid that harm may befall him. So the sons of Israel came to buy grain among those who were coming, for the famine was in the land of Canaan also. Now Joseph was the ruler over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And Joseph brother, Joseph's brothers came and bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. With their faces to the ground. Notice here that, he, that you know, Joseph was over all the land, and it says he was the one who sold to all the people. So he's in the position that anybody coming and wanting food had to go through Joseph. So Jacob's family had to see Joseph. Um, and, and notice also, because what, what did we learn last time at the beginning? You know, kind of what got Joseph in trouble with his brothers was his dreams. And he would share his dreams with his brothers. And it was like, you know, everybody's going to bow down to me. My, we're all going to be these sheaves. And my sheaf is going to stand upright, and all the rest of your sheaves are going to bow to me. Then it was the sun, the stars, and the moon, meaning mom, dad, and all the kids are going to bow down to me. And here it is. It takes place uh, in history as they bow down to him with their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he disguised himself. He disguised himself to them and spoke to them harshly. And he said to them, where have you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. But Joseph had recognized his brothers, although they did not recognize him. Joseph remembered the dreams. Joseph remembered the dreams. And it's interesting because he recognizes them, hasn't seen them for 13 years. They've all grown up, but he knew uh, and recognized them. Um, they didn't recognize him probably because, again, 13 years. Um, and he was younger, so you change more the younger you are. And he's, you know, he's not in his typical humble Hebrew attire. He's all fancied up. As you know, so we said, you know, Pharaoh gave him his ring and the necklace and put him in this, 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 this fine uh, linen. And, and, and so, you know, he's, he can play this thing incognito and he really does take advantage of that. Joseph remembered the dreams which he had had about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to look at the undefended parts of our land. Now 42.17, he says, So he put them all together in prison for three days. Okay. Uh, 21 to 24. Yeah, hold on there for a sec. Um, put him in prison for three days. So again, he knows who they are. He knows he's making all this up. And he really does, we'll see, he plays with them quite a bit through this. The first thing he does is to say, you know, accuse them of being spies. Um, and, and, I, and I suppose some of this probably really is some, you know, putting them through it because of what they did to him. Um, it is the teaching of a lesson. It is for them because they really do. They feel the heat later and they believe it is because of the guilt concerning their brother. Um, puts them in prison. And again, we have this three-day thing about being put in prison and Jesus that was you know, I believe spent three days in, in hell when he was uh, physically dead and in the tomb. Uh, so let me go on, 42, 21. Then they said to one another, truly we are guilty concerning our brother because we saw the distress of his soul when he pleaded with us. He wouldn't. We, hadn't, we hadn't seen that part before, had we? We just saw the, the brothers 
you know, some thinking, no, let's not kill him. There, there was one that really spoke up there, and then there was another that spoke up, um, you know, maybe we should sell him, and they were all worried about, but there was nothing from Joseph's side. I mean, how much is he protesting? What, how, what is he thinking while this is going on? But here we have a little bit of that. You know, well, first of all, they feel here in verse 21, guilt, concern. This has got to be because of what we did to our brother. They have no idea that this is Joseph, but they're guilty. They feel that guilt. And that is, I mean, guilt is, it, guilt is that which causes us to turn to God. Guilt is that which causes us to turn for repentance. Guilt is what causes us to go and ask for forgiveness, um, to feel the weight of our guilt. And then it says here, though, about Joseph, what we learn is, I mean, undoubtedly, you know, he was distressed in his soul, as it says, and he pleaded with us. Uh, they're remembering how he pled for his life. Again, I cannot imagine as this one young brother and all of his brothers ganging up on him, um, but he is not taking that easy at all. We do see that he, he, he accepts it ultimately in what God does with his life, but here we see just how miserable it would have been for him as it would be for any one of us, right? He pleaded us with us, yet we would not listen. Therefore, this distress has come upon us. Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not tell you? Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen? Now comes the reckoning for his blood. They did not know, however, that Joseph understood, for there was an interpreter between them. Okay. You know, I, I have to admit that when I first read at some point that this interpreter, I'm going, wait a minute, why do they need an interpreter? Because they all speak Hebrew, you know? Joseph's going to remember Hebrew and his brothers are all speaking Hebrew. But what's going on here is, is that Joseph is speaking Egyptian and he has an Egyptian translator who's translating the Egyptian to his brothers. So his brothers think that, you know, he's an Egyptian who speaks Egyptian. He doesn't know Hebrew. So as the brothers talk, they have no idea that this right-hand man of Pharaoh, whom they're coming to for food, um, obviously that he's his brother, but he, he also understands every word they're saying. He turned away from them and wept. But when he returned to them and spoke to them, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. In Genesis 43, 1 to 5, Now the famine was severe in the land. So it came about, when they had finished eating the grain which they had brought from Egypt, that their father said to them, Go back, buy us a little food. Judah spoke to him, however, saying, The man solemnly warned us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you do not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You will not see my face unless your brother is with you. Okay. And then from here what happens is, there's a lot of this narrative that plays out where Joseph is really playing tricks on these brothers. And he does this trickery with their sacks. You know, they bought food, but when they get back after having bought the food, and empty their, their things. They, they have the food they bought, but they still have the money they were supposed to have bought it with. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's like we, we stole, somebody stole back our money or it looks as if we just stole the food because we still have the money. And so that way, again, he can really have a lot over them, okay? And then we'll see later he does a bit more of that. But let's read on uh, beginning in, in chapter 43, verse 29. As he lifted his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, he said, Is this your youngest brother of whom you spoke to me? And he said, May God be gracious to you, my son. Joseph hurried out, for he was deeply stirred over his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. And he washed his face and came out, and he controlled himself and said, Serve the meal. So they served him by himself and them by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is loathsome to the Egyptians. Mm, let's just pause there for a moment. You know, this indicates clearly that, I mean, racism is nothing new in the world. People have been 
uh, have had that, you know, dark and evil in their heart from the beginning, that we are better than them. There are lesser people simply based upon nationality or race or skin color or whatever it might be. But, you know, here you have it. Um, what? 3,400 years ago in Egypt, the Egyptians, uh-uh. We are prejudiced against those Hebrews. We're not going to eat at the same table. They've got to have their own and separate tables. And that's exactly what they did. Um, but uh, it, it seems to be a rather, gosh, even unfortunately n natural part of the fallen human heart is to have this thing that unless you're like me, you know, I mean, I'm afraid of you or I got to put you down or you're less than me. And, and let me say it again that, you know, when, when it comes to, to, you know, interracial, you know, healing and relationships and being, you know, being one in Christ is the answer. Um, the, the, the church of Jesus Christ should be the answer. Now, it's really sad that, you know, we, you can go back in our history um, 150 years ago, and there were churches that had in the back of their church, they had rooms with locks and chains that they would come to church with their slaves, and they would put them in the slave room and lock them in there, and then they'd come in and worship Almighty God. And then they'd finish and they'd go back and they'd get their slave out of that room. And then they would go back and, and can, you know, and all the mistreatment. No, the church of Jesus Christ, as much as you and I can be a, an answer to that, please, please be. If you still have any sort of remnants um, based on, you know, how you, you were raised in this world or even experiences you've had or whatever it is, man, seek the Lord and seek his spirit and seek to know that, man, he created us all, man and woman, and absolutely equal before him, and we're the ones that really need to show the way toward that and not let you know, the amount of melanin that's different between us uh, be some, uh, <clears throat> some dark uh, expression. Uh, but truly have the love of Jesus and, and, and even reach out all the more. You know, go into the communities. Be a bridge. Be a missionary somewhere. Um, okay. Now they were seated before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in astonishment. You know, isn't that interesting? Because they realized that as they're seated at the table, that they're seated in age order. There's the youngest on one end, and the oldest on the other end. And of course, you know, they're sitting there going, this Egyptian, which he had that Egyptian name, you know, he, how, how did he do that? You know, or is this a coincidence? But they looked at each other with astonishment. I thought that was cool. He took portions to them from his own table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. So they feasted and drank freely with him. Mm -hmm. So Joseph's modeling some across the table stuff here, isn't he? Because it would have also been verboten, you know, to, to take food from the Egyptian table. But, but of course, you know, he's, he's a pretty powerful guy. And he's going to do what he wants to do. So he took food, his own food, from his own table, and he shared it with his brothers. But here, too, we're seeing still this favoritism thing played out because he gives Benjamin, because Benjamin and he are brothers of the same mother, and there's this, you know, he's, he, he, he has this favoritism toward young Benjamin. Um, but he does reach out, and, and, and that's seen by others, and he was willing uh, to step out and do that. Um, and then in chapter 44, because we're going to resume in chapter 45, verse 1, 44, we see more of this trickery with the sacks. And it even includes that there's this cup, this cup that would have been in Pharaoh's house, and it ends up in one of the bags of these lowly Hebrews. And so the thing is, is like, 
obviously, you know, you've stolen it. And it said, you know, whoever's bag we find it in, you know, you shall be a slave uh, of mine. And you, and, and you will remain here with me. So he does that in order to keep Benjamin with him. So that whole story plays out in chapter 44. And we will resume uh, in chapter 45, verse 1. And Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. There was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. Ah, uh, so here, the, the climax of the story is beginning to gain traction. Uh, for Joseph, now he's revealed himself to his brothers. And of course, you know, they, they were speechless. They, they, were, they didn't answer and they were just made at his presence. He weeps, he comes back in and, you know, I'm your brother. You know, it was just too, too out of mind to grasp. But then here he's saying, do not be grieved or angry with yourselves. He, here and as elsewhere, as we continue, Joseph goes out of his way to put his brothers at ease. Um, so he says to him here, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God, here it is, for God sent me before you to preserve life. He sent me before so I am the one who had the wisdom to have the plan to see that Egypt would have an abundance of food when the rest of the world is in severe uh, famine and he has placed me here. He sent me before you for the express, expressed purpose to preserve life. Verse 6. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. So again, there's reinforced. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you, for there are still five years of famine to come and you and your household and all that you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt, and all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers and wept on them, and afterwards his brothers talked with him. Genesis 45:24. So he sent his brothers away. And as they departed, he said to them, do not quarrel on the journey. Yeah, go ahead. Then they went up from Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. They told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and indeed he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. But he was stunned, for he did not believe them. Just as they didn't recognize him and were dismayed when he revealed himself, now the brothers come back and tell of a story that Jacob... Is, is not able to be an eyewitness. Um, and and he, remember when Joseph said, and tell father of all my splendor here. So there's probably more to it than what we've just read here. And, and it's just like, I've, for all these years, I thought he's dead. And you're saying that he's alive. And he's a ruler of Egypt. And he's the one from whom you're getting, you know, this food. And, and it's just, you know, it's just a bit much, uh, you know, for dad to, to take in all at once, at least. Verse 27. And they told him all the words of Joseph that he had spoken to them. And when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. Then Israel said, It is enough. My son Joseph is still alive. 
I will go and see him before I die. In Genesis 46, 1. So Israel set out with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I will go down before you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again. And Joseph will close your eyes. Hmm. Some really important phrases in that last sentence or two. Um, because remember, one of the things we often remind ourselves is that God keeps his, say it with me, promises, right? God keeps his promises. When we saw with Isaac, uh, you know, the story of Isaac, where Abraham was about to sacrifice him, he just, he knew that God was so faithful that the, 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 the the promise was going to come through Isaac, not somebody else. So even if he died, he believed he would raise him from the dead. Um, and he also believed about that maybe there would be a substitute. God will provide. And that's how he did it with this lamb caught in the thicket. And, and so the promise of God. And so here what he says, you know, Almighty God speaks and says, I will make a great nation of you there in Egypt. I will make a great nation of you, the fulfillment of the promise. And then he says, and here's so good, I will go down there with you. I'll go to Egypt with you, he says. I will go down with you to Egypt. Because you know where he always says, I won't forsake you, I'll always be with you. When he says, go and make disciples of all the nations, I might go, oh gosh, Lord, I don't know how to do that. I don't know if I'm all, uh, you know. But when he says, ah, but... I will go with you. Oh, okay. Um, that makes all the difference in the world. So he, he, he speaks about them being a great nation. He says, I'm going to go with you to Egypt. So it's encouraging Jacob to take that step of faith. And then look at this as well. I will also surely bring you up again. It's in verse 4. So because the promised land is not Egypt, I will make you a great nation in Egypt. But I will bring you out again. I will bring you down back to Canaan where the promised land has already been marked out for the people of Israel. So the promise, the promise, the promise. And then, of course, the phrase Joseph will close your eyes, meaning he will die. you will die, but Joseph will be the one there to close your eyes and it'll be okay. Genesis 47, 5. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is at your disposal. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them live in the land of Goshen. And if you know any capable men among them, then put them in charge of my livestock. Then Joseph brought his father, Jacob, and presented him to Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How many years have you lived? So Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my sojourning are one hundred and thirty. Few and unpleasant have been the years of my life, nor have they attained the years that my fathers lived during the days of their sojourning. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had ordered. Joseph provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to their little ones. According to their little ones. According to the littles. Meaning, you know, just proportionally as was needed. Uh, verse 12, Joseph provided. Joseph becomes the provider. Ultimately, as, we, as, as we're working toward the, 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 the sustainer, the savior um, of the people of Israel. What we see in, uh, in chapter 47 is that Joseph is also really a brilliant businessman he had pretty much I mean everywhere storehouses of grain and food bread but everyone who came there was never um, just you know freely given away there was always a manner in which it was paid for and so by the time it was done Pharaoh owned 
Pharaoh and Joseph owned virtually all of Egypt. See, it wasn't like that he was some, you know, the Pharaoh wasn't one who, who, you know, owned all of Egypt. He ruled all of Egypt, and people had their places. But through this process of having to come and continue to give more in order to obtain the bread of life, um, he ends up uh, owning even all of Egypt. So he was a, he was a brilliant a businessman, chapter 47. In chapter 49, uh, we see here Jacob, or Israel, he prophesies over his 12 sons. Really significant things in a bigger picture, but, but not what we're trying to focus on here today. But he prophesies over his tw 12 sons in chapter 49. And then in chapter 50, Jacob dies and is buried, or Israel dies and is buried. That's the first part of chapter 50. We will resume chapter 50, verse 15 to the end, uh, and with a few further comments. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us Go ahead. and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Mm -hmm. Joseph wept. Uh, you know, the, the shortest verse in the Bible, right? People often say, you know, it's just Jesus wept. But this is the third or fourth time when we see Joseph cry. Uh, I think Joseph was a manly man. Joseph was strong and courageous. He was uh, brilliant. He was a man who was always able and willing to take charge and, and, and you know, make things better, make things grow and prosper and be fruitful. He was a remarkable individual. But men, he, he was willing to show his emotions. Now, perhaps it was because they were just, you know, he tried to control them and couldn't. I don't know. But God has gone out of his way within the brevity of, this, of Scripture to note for us on four occasions where throughout this process, and, and remember also when the one where it's like, you know, the household, all the household could hear him. He was crying so loudly. And, uh, and so here once again, Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Um, you know, they were concerned that Joseph might bear a grudge against them. Now that, you know, now that dad's dead and, you know, whoa, it's like, you know, maybe now he's going to really begin to mistreat us, and he only didn't because of that. He's going, no, that's not it at all. Um, and he will go on to say, do not be afraid. But continuing then, I guess, in verse 18. And his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for I am I in God's place okay. as for you. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result preserve many people alive. There we, we come to the, the crux, the climax, that incredible phrase. This is, this is where it is. This is its context and where he comes and he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to, or for this purpose, right? In order to bring about this present result. And what is that? To preserve many people alive. Had all of those things that Joseph went through through those 13 years plus, all, then the years under Pharaoh and with Pharaoh, I don't know how difficult some of those years would have been, but it's been at least nine years because it was the seven years, we know we're two years into the famine portion. So it's been another nine years. He's 39 at this point. And so, um, but, he, but, but that phrase, which is so powerful, can teach us so many things about our lives 
before God. And when bad things happen, sometimes bad things seem to happen, and when bad things really do happen, uh, do not be afraid, he says. What you meant for evil against me, God meant for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Verse 21. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Comforted them and spoke kindly to them. See, there he was, bore no grudge. Uh, he, he has come to a place of forgiveness. Forgiveness is difficult. Forgiveness can often be one of the most difficult things we do because we have to own the wound against us. It, it was never paid back. What they did to Joseph, now sure, he played with him a little bit, scared him a little bit with the jail and the, you know, the trickery and the sex and stuff. Um, but no, it, it's never about coming back to a place of, of balance or equity when harm is done. It's, it's, it's leave room for God, leave room for the wrath of God. Vengeance is his. But to love and to forgive because forgiveness is what frees us. Joseph would have been in a horrible state. He would have been in rebellion against Almighty God and he would have created for himself just a horrific and, 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 and degrading um, you know, mental and emotional health um, through holding on to unforgiveness. Man, I have seen that. I have seen that play out and in some of the most ugly ways with a person who is unable to forgive, unwilling to forgive. It's, it, it's been said that it's like, you know, drinking poison and expecting, you know, your enemy to die. Uh, the poison of unforgiveness damages us. The other person is not affected at all. They actually might even rejoice in your pain ongoing. But we've got to give it to God. Give it up. Let the healing come. Uh, it's not easy. Sometimes it does take time, but we must recognize that we can never come to a place where we delude ourselves and convince ourselves that hanging on to a certain part of this is okay. They deserve it. No, no. And there's no other time that we are more like God than when we forgive. Because he has forgiven us. He has forgiven me. It comes back to the whole thing, you know, how, who am I then not to forgive another? But really, I, seriously, you know, there, one of the ways in which we are most like God is when we extend forgiveness to other people because there's no other way I have a relationship, a loving and good and healthy relationship with my Heavenly Father except that He chose to forgive me. And we act a lot like our Father when we extend forgiveness to other people. And so He forgives them. He says, don't be afraid. He comforts them and He speaks kindly to them. And then we come to our last paragraph. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household. And Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. There is again the promise. The promise remembered and knowing the promise is sure. Not even like probably, you know, for sure. He says the land which he got promised on oath. Because remember with Abraham, he, he, he did an oath on his own, right? You would cut an animal in half. And typically the way it worked is you cut an animal in half and the two parties would walk between the severed animal. And it would be kind of like, if either one of us breaks this, then may it be done to us what was done to this animal. God did that, but it says that he himself, he went through. 
in, the, in two different manifestations, light-type manifestations of, of Almighty God. So God covenanted and promised himself on oath. Abraham became the beneficiary, but he had no, uh, uh, no role in the fulfillment. It's all God, right? Same with our salvation. It's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus only. Not Jesus plus, I mean, anything. I mean, even I think when we come to the point of faith, we believe the gospel. God has supplied this dead person the ability to even echo those words, that it is, it is Jesus and Jesus alone. And so here, you know, with the, when he made oath with himself, it was God alone. Abraham, you're the beneficiary. He says to us, you know, Darren, you're the beneficiary. I died in your place. I promised to myself. I did it all. All you do, all we do is recognize and say yes to the truth of what God has said. So here is the gospel that we, we have to agree with God that Jesus that died on the cross. That, he died, that he's almighty God, start with, nothing less. And he died on the cross in my place as a substitute. In my place, how, why in my place? Because I deserve to die on the cross. He died in my place as a substitute for me. He died and, and was, was paid my penalty in full through suffering and death and hell and rose from the dead on the third day and gives new life to those who believe. It all Jesus. And so for you, if, if, if that's new or clearer for you today, be born again today. Uh, that Jesus died in your place because you deserved it and he, he rose again from the dead and gives new life to those who believe. Um, and so here the promise on oath Remember, he says to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, who then was renamed Israel, becomes you know, the father of the 12 tribes and then this giant nation of, of Israel. And then finally, our last sentence or two. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. He was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. That's how Genesis ends. Uh, but note here again, you know, Joseph's faith. I love this too, man, because, and, and, and even J Jacob did similarly. He said, you know, uh, take, take me ultimately to the, to the land. God, you know, the, pro the land God promised. But here it's like what Joseph says, hey man, you gotta promise me because I, I will likely die here in Egypt, but this isn't the promised land and God's promise is so sure, it doesn't matter whether I'm alive or dead, that after I've died and there's nothing but bones, promise me that you will take my bones and you will carry them to the promised land and I will enter the promised land with you and I will be buried with my ancestors in the promised land. Just an other statement of faith that Joseph offers. Uh, Joshua was, was, when we were working through this, he had shared with me and asked me whether I'd seen this, uh, this story about a prominent uh, burial tomb in Egypt um, that was empty. And, uh, and so, and don't be fooled. If you, if you look at some scholarship, you'll find, oh, you know, this was such a big deal, but there's no record of it in Egypt. Well, but there is. He, remember, they changed his name. He goes by a different name. <clears throat> there was a time during these pharaohs where there, there was this vice regent, there was this, this one who ruled, um, and because of his lofty position, he would have been afforded Likely not, not a pyramid. That was Pharaoh's. That's the king. Even though he was just about there, he was not Pharaoh. He was not king. Um, but likely there is that place. And all I know is, is whether it exists, it, it, whether it exists, but whether or not we ever find it or haven't found it is immaterial because I believe God and I trust God. And those brothers would have been faithful and they would have carried his bones um, to Egypt. So now, quick summary of the whole business. And we will share communion together in, in light of these <clears throat> wonderful truths of God. 
Uh, again, going back to Joseph was 17 years old when it all started. His brothers plotted against him to put him to death. Instead, they sold him into slavery. And day after day in Potiphar's house, man, he, he dealt with righteously temptation day after day. Then he was falsely accused, thrown into prison. Cupbearer forget, forgets him. Two years later, he's, he's brought before Pharaoh and interprets his dream. And then just like when he was elevated in Potiphar's house, elevated at prison, he's elevated in Egypt, <clears throat> becomes a ruler of one of the most pop, pop, powerful nations on earth. He was 30 when he stood before Pharaoh. So 13 years transpired. Again, mixed up, mixed in that would have been suffering as a servant, suffering uh, in prison. Uh, in, in chapter 45, Joseph says to his brothers, Do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Man, I remember when I used to fight God so much when it came to circumstances in life. You know, like if there's a delay somewhere or, you know, that ferry broke down or that, I missed that airplane or, you know, man, I would get so riled up. And it was finally, finally, it would be like, wait, relax. God's got it all under control. You'll, there, might, there are things he might be rearranging for a really good purpose. Or it could be just to teach me patience. Sometimes there's a big reason, sometimes... But, oh, and this is the man. This is the man. God himself speaks to Jacob in chapter 46. I will make you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. And I will surely bring you up again. Because I have said so. Chapter 50, Joseph again speaks to his brothers and says, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you. And bring you up from, him, from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. And then the, the, the pinnacle point, Genesis 50, 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. What was meant for evil, God meant for good. That, that amazing miracle power of God to, to make good out of bad. He doesn't need the bad. He would have done these things differently. He doesn't need our sin. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't need the bad. It doesn't make the bad good. But he's able to work it. And that's where we could achieve greater sense of peace and just, you know, stability through having that kind of faith and trust and a God who's our father. We need to remember, sometimes, you know, remember who your father is. Don't forget who your father is. Joseph then becomes the physical savior of Israel. In the first half, we saw Joseph as the rejected brother, as Jesus was. In the second half, here we, we see that he is the savior of all Israel, as Jesus is, you know, the spiritual savior of all Israel and the, G the Gentile the mystery of Ephesians 3, the church. Um, and here, just kind of a sort of a transition into Moses, because that'll be next. Um, I love this because when Israel went into Egypt, it was like, kind of like, like going into the womb. There were only 70. Scripture tells us there were 70 in all that went into Egypt. It's what we just read when Jacob and his family went to settle in the best of the land. There were 70 in Jacob's household. Um, Israel germinates or, or gestates um, for 215 years. Some have it as 430. I think there's reason to believe that it was actually 215. He, Israel gestates for 215 years in the womb of Egypt. And an estimated 3 million people are in the great exodus. Um, to the promised land that 215 years later as the nation of Israel is birthed out of Egypt. And so uh, we even see in Matthew chapter 2 
in reference to Jesus, it says, as the prophet has said, and he quotes Hosea, but in reference to Jesus, he says, out of Egypt, I called my son. Because remember, uh, his parents took him to Egypt to, to protect him from Herod. And then he came out of Egypt. Hosea 11 says, when Israel was a youth, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. And this takes us right up to the, our next uh, type, our next place where I think we really see clearly uh, Jesus typified in the Old Testament and Moses, uh, the deliverer. Okay? Um, oh, but don't, we mustn't be in a hurry. We at least have a week to ruminate over Joseph. Um, and to try and embrace some of that same mentality of faith, integrity, and patience, and trusting God, and waiting, and finding this, your place at the right place, at the right time, to God's glory. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you. I, I thank you that there was a man such as Joseph that can be uh, just a profound, a profound example for us in our lives. Help us, Lord, to indeed be more like Joseph as Joseph was a lot like you. And we are to be more like you. Uh, help us to have that faith, that trust, uh, just the, the, the long-suffering, the patience, the waiting, uh, to see you in the events of our lives and not just random things that are that we might be your man, your woman, your, your young, your child in the right place at the right time to do your will and for your glory. Uh, I ask in Jesus' name. And Father, also, as we share communion together, you say to do this in remembrance of me. Lord, that we would remember we remember the biblical historical things of your willing, loving, giving of yourself a sacrifice on our behalf, raising from the dead. We would also remember the many ways in which you have just entered into our life uh, for good. And have been there at the right, just at the right time, the right place, and to be the one, to be the savior, the deliverer, the helper, the rescuer. All the ways in which you have touched us in our lives, Lord, help us remember as we do this together. I ask this too in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to ask the elders to come up and we will distribute this together. And, uh, and share in this time of, <clears throat> of communion together. Do you want to take some and take to the bath? Okay.
<clears throat> and he, uh, he took the bread of the Passover meal, at this point coming to that piece of matzah that had been, uh, thank you, had been broken uh, and wrapped in white linen and hidden away, sometimes even buried, to be discovered later by one of the children who received a reward for and then that's the one he took and he said uh, this represents my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me Go ahead. He shared the third cup. The third cup of the Passover meal was the cup of redemption. And uh, gave it new significance in saying that this represents my body or my blood shed for you. Remission of sins is the blood of the new covenant. And he gathered. It's also noteworthy that Jesus gathered with his best friends uh, and celebrated this communion together as we do as his friends, the family, the body of Christ.
Amen. So please stand with us as we sing our closing song. Uh, just a reminder, particularly uh, signing up for Sunday school, uh, the older teens, men, women, uh, sign-up sheets are in the, uh, in the other room in the back, <clears throat> as well as for Passover, and then there's small groups and such as well. But thank you. God bless.